everyone, and welcome to Director Watch, an awards watch podcast that attempts to get inside the mind of cinema's greatest auteurs, explore what drives them, and maybe we go on a few unrelated tangents along the way. I'm Ryan McQuaid, the executive editor here at Awards Watch, and joining me today, as always, is my co-host, Jay Ledbetter. And today we aim for our first ever three-hour podcast <laughs> as we explore the wonderful world of Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia. How to describe this movie? I don't even know. Is that? But this is an important one, Ryan. I think for many people, this is a very, very big PTA flick. I think they're all pretty important from this point point on. Though, Fair, Jay. yeah. I mean, like the, everyone has a different entry point. This is definitely an entry point. It's also a film, a part of an extraordinary year of cinema. Yeah, we've talked about. It's crazy that PTA is a part of two of probably the biggest years of cinema in our lives in 1999 and 2007. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely one of the most discussed uh, films of that year. And uh, it couldn't just be you and me. Jay, no, that's just, absolutely that's not. Just, we got to we got to add another interweaving thread. Yeah, this is. Yeah, we've got to add another storyline. Fate. Someone else that's going to sing the song with us because yes. we're going to totally do that tonight. And he is the managing editor over at RogerEber.com. It's our good friend Brian Tellerico. Brian, welcome to Director Watch. Trying to figure out if I'm John C. Riley or William H Macy. Or, I mean, who do you want to be? Player? You get. Yeah. <laughs> Who uh, Julianne Moore. I'll take Tom Cruise. I'll take Tom Cruise. You're going to take Tom Cruise. Okay. And <laughs> Jay, you're Julianne Moore. Yeah. I took 14 <laughs> Xanax before this episode. <laughs> um, I think I want to be, uh, oh, man, who the hell do I want to be? There's a lot of despicable human beings in this movie. I was going to say, take... we all want to be Riley. Riley's the only, like one of the few decent. Yeah. People. I was going to say, can I just be <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman? Can I just be like sure. the ni- a yeah. nice guy? There you go. There you go. You know, because everyone else is a giant turd sandwich in this movie it feels like um well brian I, stanley i, gonna, I can no, be that's stanley true. that's true you could be you know what jay you could be the old man at the bar that's trying to hit on uh on hit on on the bartender uh, uh yeah sense. one of one of the classic oh he was in an altman movie i'd like to put him in my movie guys <laughs> in PTA's exactly <laughs> that's like half of the first half of pta's entire career is just doing that um brian Thank you for being here. Talking Magnolia. Sure. sure. Uh, I got to ask you, buddy, what you think of PTA? What you think of him as a, as a, as a director? Also, what was your first PTA you ever saw? Did you see it in theaters? I'm old, I'm old so I saw Heart 8 slash Sydney. You saw Heart 8. Uh, okay. All right. You were the yeah, one of I'm five not... people that went opening weekend. Okay. I played at a theater I worked at. I was working at a movie theater at the time Hard Eight played, so I definitely saw it. So I've been there from the beginning. I mean, PTA is an essential American filmmaker, without question. No matter even what, you, even if you don't like him, he's influenced so many people and done so much. And he's just a. I don't want to get ahead of myself in Magnolia, but the thing I thought while watching Magnolia is that I, I'm going to be the old man in the room here. This movie doesn't get made anymore. Like this, this is one of those I haven't seen this movie in a long damn time, and I feel sad about that like magnolia would be an eight hour apple tv plus miniseries right now wouldn't be a movie so and so i i think pta what he was doing back then isn't being done anymore and it's important to recognize and appreciate what he did in the time and the fact that the fact that this movie got made in 99 is kind of crazy to be honest he took that power he had from boogie nights and the success of that and made a three hour bawling frog <laughs> like very talky emotional character driven ensemble thing yeah it's altman we're going to get to altman eventually but altman wasn't getting this kind of cast or budget or prestige or claim or widespread release magnolia played a lot of places it was wide it was a big deal and again i miss those days yeah so i mean it's like a 50 million dollar box office i mean yeah it was made on 37 but 37 million dollars to make a three hour um grief epic with I guess the biggest could. star in the world <laughs> yeah with yeah. yeah with the biggest su- one of the biggest right. superstars of the time and still what's, what's comparable recently i can't even think of anything everything's I mean, high concepts hook now i mean don't look give up. me a I mean, obviously, it's right there. It's right there. No, I mean, I what you're talking think, about, right? honestly, the thing I was thinking about a little bit, although it was made for much less money, was Bo is Afraid was the only thing that I was like, here's a That's completely super high concept, like almost like a surreal nightmare. This is two people like John C. Riley and Melora Walters sitting and talking at a bar about the problems of their sure. lives. That does not fucking happen. I don't know if I can swear on this podcast. Sorry. Yeah, you can do it. I cannot remember. <laughs> The last time I saw something like that in a fifty million dollar movie, like literally can't remember. Even the good stuff, the good dramas of late, have a hook, have like some sort of yeah. 
high concept presentation to them. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this would be. I, I'm I, I, I'm getting super far ahead again. I miss John C. Riley and William H. Macy and those kind of performers in films that would get widely released. And now they're all in television. I interviewed William H. Macy about 12 years ago. And we were talking then about why so many people were moving to TV. And he looked at me and he was like, because the mid-budget character movie is disappearing. And it hmm. completely disappeared. It all went to television. So that that mid-budget character thing, and this is even high budget for 99 a little bit, but the mid-budget $20 million character study is gone. And so I miss that kind of thing. And yeah, there's yeah. crawling frogs and stuff, but this is still a movie that has multiple hours of conversation doesn't happen like we mm -hmm. just don't see that nowadays so and that's what i so i, I kind of got away from the question but i miss <laughs> i miss that aspect of pta and like his ability to present really richly drawn characters there's almost no one like him in that regard in terms of oh i know that guy I, I can get my arms around that guy and who he is and where he was before the movie started and where he might be going after these fully complex characters. When I think of PTA, I think of the people in his movies, not the hook or the high concept. Yeah. So. Jay, do you have anything? I mean, it, it is the, the one thing about PTA that we've kind of brought up multiple times on the, on the podcast is PTA is one of the great directors of actors ever. And, you know, if, if this is if, if you say this is Tom Cruise's best performance, I think that's entirely valid. If you say this is I don't know, I, I don't know about Julianne Moore's performance, we'll probably get to that. We're going to talk about it. We're gonna talk um, about it. But um, I mean, there are so many. I, I actually think Philip Seymour Hoffman's performance in this movie, as sort of understated as it is so compared good. to so many of his other performances, that is such on paper, a perfunctory character who's just there to basically move the plot along. And he has so much empathy and, and understanding the scene where Tom Cruise is bawling in front of his dad is obviously great in and of itself. But when you have Philip Seymour Hoffman framed sort of out of focus in the background bawling as well behind him, it just adds this whole new layer of um, that really double down on the on the empathy in, in that scene. And he's subtly funny in the movie and uh, Anyway, I mean, Paul Zimmerhoffen's the best, but if you said this was his best performance, I'd be like, you know what? Kind of a weird choice, but I don't disagree with you. And and that goes on down the line to where Paul Thomas Anderson is just giving these actors who normally don't get kind of these meaty roles to really chew on. And interestingly, this is kind of the end for a lot of these people who are staples in his movies up to this point. Yeah. Um, like I would Riley. love to see him work with Philip Baker Hall again, but or not anymore, I guess. But since oh, then, yeah, I've have, have worked with yeah. him. Um, no, I miss this. I miss this John C. Riley to death. Yeah, I exactly. Miss the Riley, yeah. who could do character work like this. Yeah, like when I, Riley I thought, shows up in like in Licorice Pizza for like two seconds, you're like, oh, oh give him God. more, give him two scenes, give him something, give him. Anything. You know what I thought when they did in that scene was just like, I'm glad they're still. Tight. friends that's cool because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then they might do like what if yeah. he gives him that big comeback part where you like is just incredible like how yeah. amazing would that be how much would we all embrace that how much would we embrace if john c Riley was the lead of the next pta movie i think people would lose their minds how much have we like I, got like back with like uh with Cheadle or or with william h macy or even worked with julianne moore again like these are yeah these these actors that like have gone on in the like two decades since and have done great bodies of work but I mean, you know, he's also like done amazing work as well, too, that we'll talk about in the upcoming weeks. But um, I think after the one, two of Boogie and Magnolia, I understand a desire to like not want to do that again. Yeah, they like, strip to it back to like, yeah. yeah, to well, to restart with new people, not become too attached to the same people. I think that likely was the impetus there. But when we talk about when I talk about missing character drama, like I miss this Riley, this Macy Philip mm -hmm. Seymour Hoffman, of course, Hall, of course, the the Cruz who challenged himself. Like there's well, I watched it again this morning just to do a full current refresh. And I kept thinking, man, I miss all of this. Like it feels more like a time capsule than it used to. The last I can't remember the last time I saw it, maybe 10 years ago, but it feels further away. It feels like really far away and in a way that's like maybe cements it more as a classic now. Um when you get old, it's not great for movies you lived through and remember vividly to become classics. <laughs> but, but, but I'm I'm comfortable with this one being one of them. Um, it's it's a remarkable movie, and it feels more remarkable because of how much it doesn't exist 
anymore, like at all. And to go back to Hoffman real quick, if we can, if we're just kind of spinning wherever the conversation takes us, I think his part, Jay, is like really essential to what the movie is about in terms of empathy and listening to other people Mm -hmm. and like being, being in the moment and being present for people. I think that's a really key theme that ties a lot of these things together. Um, Being able to listen to people and forgive them. The last scene of this movie, again, I'm going to get way ahead of myself, is maybe my favorite PTA Anderson ending. PT Anderson ending. Um, I think it's perfect. And it's about being there for someone and listening and just being present with people. And Hoffman kind of carries that and anchors a lot of that emotion without overplaying it. There's so much. And if you want to rip on Julian Moore, you can now. There's so much in this movie that could go too broad. It could go a little too grief epic. And Hoffman never goes too far. He he kind of anchors things back and pulls things back because he was the best. Yeah, so. I mean, you I mean you mentioned it, Brian, and that's what I kind of when I was watching it this go round, or I watched it also like a, a month ago too. So I've seen it twice and recently. Just like the concept of his last film is in the San Fernando Valley, the porn industry, the rise and fall of that you sort of have these mentor figures, and it's. In you know very very heavy on the influences still in there too and and obviously this is you know Jay and I we've talked about this in the past like this is a movie like this doesn't exist if something he if he doesn't have a lot of love for something like shortcuts um, you know but this is a movie like you're mentioning it's it's about the setting in the San Fernando Valley it's about just the idea of love forgiveness the meaning of life what that all means. And let's just have conversations and let's see if we can connect them. I mean, the the opening to this is like right up there with there will be blood for me in terms of like, what a great concept of just kind of like, you know, if you're going to do this intersecting sort of storyline thing that is so popular in this era too, right? In this late 90s, early 2000s era, this becomes like the thing to do. If you're a, a established director, you're going to make some sort of you know, jump back in time, go over here or take this storyline and throw it over there. And, oh, this person that saw you at the bar here, then it becomes the most important person in your life. And um, for better or worse, that leads to something like crash. And then and then Hollywood was like, oh, shit, well, we have a problem on our hands. Um, but but when in the hands of somebody that knows what the fuck they're doing, like PTA, it can be, I think, a really effective vehicle to explore emotions that he he taps into a lot in boogie nights but is taking in a step further because like these like boogie nights all those characters are cool but then they also have this hinge of of being sad and and this broken family in this movie like so many of these characters like we mentioned they're super sad and they're super it's super moody but then when they're together at the end it's you're you're like thank god these weirdos have each other in these moments where literally it's raining frogs from the sky and I, I I love all the little moments more than just the big moments because I think that's that's the thing that they got the publicity or or gets people in the door is like the frogs and you know and Tom Cruise and you know se, you know the seduce and destroy and all that stuff like I think that gets in there but then the movie for me is like Philip Baker Hall and Jason Robarts these two veteran actors that one uh, that PTA had worked with uh, for a bunch but then also Robarts who I think is just absolutely incredible in this movie, just steals it. And that's the thing that I think I miss I more Robards. is having an right. actor like that. We don't have actors like that anymore that just, for me, consistently just, it's just a year after, this is a year before he dies, is willing to go still there at the late, late stages of their life. And yeah. give you just this massive empathy machine for a person in the descriptions of his own account is a giant regretful piece of shit to his family mm-hmm. and has created essentially a sexist toxic monster in his son played by Tom Cruise. And so I think that that's that to me is is really interesting in, to, in terms of also then Philip Baker Hall, the generational trauma. Mm-hmm that is that is taking place in this and that it's it's the the wheel it's always turning and and uh and, and all those themes in the film i think are, are truly fascinating but jay i know you watched it today you said you yep. had some you had thoughts he texted me earlier brian he said i have thoughts on this movie i didn't and i asked good or bad and he just said thoughts 
So I'm curious what those thoughts are. So I'm going to treat my intro here the same way that Paul Thomas Anderson kind of treated this movie and really indulge myself for a minute and uh, <laughs> just talk about kind of my journey with this movie because it is kind of an, an interesting one. I think I first saw this movie senior year of high school, maybe freshman year of college. And I remember I took a, a film class in college and I think our first assignment was write about a scene that, that just like pick a scene in a movie that you really appreciate and write about it. And I wrote about the raining frog scene in Magnolia. And I mean, I remember watching Magnolia for the first time and just thinking, I really love the sensation I felt when I watched that frog sequence. Uh, it, sure. It's just kind of like nothing I'd ever seen before. I'm not sure I fully understand it, but just the feeling of watching it and the the swell of emotion that you feel in that moment, I thought was like a really important experience for me as far as my movie going uh, what was concerned. And I remember writing this thing. I was like, wow, I really knocked this out of the park. And then uh, my professor came back and was like, this is a very complicated scene. Um, I don't think you fully nailed it, but you know, I appreciate that you appreciate it. And I was like, Hmm. Okay. All right. So I got to figure this out more. Got it. Okay. So I kind of use that as the impetus for starting my online film writing. My first sort of movie blog was called raining frogs reviews.com. Awesome. Which the um, any, any SEO consultant would have been like, that is one of the all time worst names you could do for a movie <laughs> website. Um, but that was sort of the start of this critical thinking film journey that I've been on ever since then. And uh, obviously that, website kind of went by the wayside but i you, I wait you don't can, you don't have it still no still does not exist that that yeah. actually you looks can like buy we're still in something tonight daddy or whatever um, yeah, we're still in something tonight i'll tell you that yeah but it. um it, I, I still considered it kind of a hallmark movie for me and then i'll tell you what happened was i watched shortcuts like five years ago for the first time and shortcuts is now one of my five or ten favorite movies ever and then when I went and rewatched Magnolia after shortcuts, I was like, what an absolute hack job this is. Like, I was like, it's still really good. I like it a lot, but it's too similar. And I think I honestly think watching those movies so close together is sort of unfair to Magnolia. But that was the last time I watched it, it was immediately in the shadow of um, shortcuts. And I, I, I was sort of lower on it than I had previously been. And then I watched it today. And I think being more clear of shortcuts and also having what I often refer to as the I'm a dad now bump, uh, <laughs> this 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 thing really hit me hard. Uh, I I was I'm back on the like like Brian said, this is a classic train, just the the swelling and swelling and swelling emotionally that this movie has that culminates in that final half hour uh, of just pure cinematic perfection really i mean it, it, as far as emotionally affecting half hours of movies it it rarely gets better than the ending of magnolia and yes it's indulgent i've, I've been reading the the adam Naiman um pta book the way that he described it was a movie made without a delete button which i thought was a very <laughs> apt way of of describing it um but it, it is a movie that I appreciate on such an intense level in so many ways that I'm willing to overlook some of the kind of overwrought uh, elements of the film. And also a lot of the melodrama, I kind of appreciated more this time. And also one thing I loved watching it this time more than I ever had before was how this movie tells you how to watch it. And, and I thought that was a really effective tool. Um, and also I appreciated watching this movie from the point of view of yes this is a person making a movie like this when he was 30 or whatever and i think putting yourself in the mindset of being that age and trying to unpack these feelings uh makes it even a little more powerful main distinction i would make between this and shortcuts is what you're getting at now which is the indulgent emotions like Altman never played in this kind of what you'd call a melodramatic register. Yes. As much as I love shortcuts and as much as I love Altman, he's a much more distant 
filmmaker than mm-hmm. Anderson when it comes to character. And so that's why, yeah, they're they're both LA patchworks, but I feel like they're completely different tonally. Like, do you know what I mean? Like they're both like they're both trying to I guess they're getting at connections, but like Altman would never drop frogs from the sky and he would never have Tom Cruise crying at the side of a bed. No. Like, there's just so much more indulgence than the naturalism that Altman went for. So that's where I feel like the distinction is strongest. What I really love about Magnolia this time this morning when I watched it was I'm not sure and I want to get your guys opinion where it lands on the divide between what Ricky Jay says and basically what the kid says the kid when the frogs are falling says these things happen or something along those lines strange Mm -hmm. things just happen is it a film about how random things happen or a film like Ricky Jay argues in narration twice I might add where these things are it intentionally like this is not a coincidence he says this is this is this is fate for lack of a better word um i'm not sure where it comes down on that the first time i saw it my memory of it is the kid with the shadows of the frogs that it's a movie about Mm. randomness you can be living your life and a frog will fall from the sky or you'll lose your gun or you'll run into someone at a bar and that it's a movie about random events but then you've got a voiceover that multiple times says no it's not random this is this is life. This is fate. This is something bigger than all of us. So where do you guys land on what, where the, where do you think the movie lands or does it want us to decide? I think, I think it wants us to decide. I think it's, I mean, fundamentally it's the age old question, even just about spirituality and religion, right? Is there something there? Is it something that connects us all that's grander than us or is there nothing? And it's just a coincidence or it's just, it's just something that happens and we have to pick up and move on emotionally. And like at the end, I think, you know, <laughs> that's what's so interesting about the ending of the movie. And like after the frogs are down on the ground, what happens? Things are resolved, but then life moves on. There's not this giant, you don't see the mobs out. You don't see people in the streets screaming like what's going on, all this stuff. It's, you know, and it's there's thousands of dead frogs on the ground. And what happens? William H. Macy just gets in his car and moves on with his sad life. You know what I mean? And so I think the movie wants you to decide that. I don't think it wants to take that choice, even though this movie does make a lot of wild choices directorially and with these characters and getting them together and how it all connects. I think ultimately at the end, at least for me, Jay, you can speak for for yourself. I think it's to the eye of the beholder, and I think that I'm with you, Brian. I still don't know where it wants to where I, because I think personally for me, you know, at least for me, spirituality, spirituality, I can't speak tonight, and religion is something that is such a complicated thing for myself. So the yeah. idea, so the idea of fully believing that this is all connected and that somebody is pulling the puppet strings is a little too much for me but the other part of me goes well this can't all be crazy that i saw this guy here and this guy here and then none of that works together but i you know maybe the beginning of the movie which is so great it does explain that as 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 such that all this is connected like this guy with the black like with the the pat oswalt scene the blackjack dealer that screws over the guy but then he's got a job to do but then he scoops him up and then and then he's dead in a tree and you're like and then that guy kills himself because of all the grief surrounding all that is that a coincidence is that we know that right the opening stuff is true the 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 thing about the dude yeah 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 Yeah. but is that but is that a coincidence is that terrible luck you know what i mean is is that planned who knows and i think i think pta is asking those i i I think it's an incidence of a young man relatively young man (laughs) trying to decide himself if he's pro Mm -hmm. or anti-fate if he believes that there's some greater scheme to all of this and asking ricky j to offer some opinions and then and then leaving us with that wonderful smile at the end that smile that's like hey that looks right where melora looks right at the camera and is like hey i'm happy you're happy let's all go just live our lives Mm -hmm. and that's all we can do is be happy and listen to Amy Mann. Exactly. Jay. And if you, yeah. And if you want to really draw the line between the uh, shortcuts and Magnolia, the difference is shortcuts ends with abusers being absolved of their evil through an act of God. Whereas in this film, an act of God to me, there is no 
correct explanation of you know what this movie is really about i view the frogs now as a, a quasi apocalyptic biblical uh reckoning with the kind of masculine exploitation of the past because that seems to be kind of the main thread of every one of these interweaving stories mm. um and this idea that it is sort of a a cleansing i mean if you look at the biblical story of the threat of the frogs raining down it really is like this is a punishment so that we can cleanse everything and kind of reset and there is a reset going on and then what does stanley say afterwards he says you have to be nicer to me which is sort of very simply what this movie is about it is a very indulgent narratively complicated emotionally complex film that really boils down to what if dads were nicer to their kids um and so yeah. I, I i think it is just really metaphorical obviously biblical uh metaphor for a redemption arc for fatherhood as we're approaching 2000 i mean this is firmly implanted in the uh y2k masculine crisis yes. fatherhood huge part of it but i'm not sure it's just father's kids father to kids because melora walter's character freaks out because john c Riley is the first person who's ever to listen to her or talk to her or it's so it's kind of but is that because she has such a difficult relationship with men because of her relationship oh, of with her dad yes agreed but it's also i think thematically relevant to uh, uh john c Riley is just it, it's about listening to other people just being mm -hmm. there for other people and listening to what they have to say whether it's your kid primarily your kid you're right about father being a key part but also just being present for people instead of being uh, trying to search and destroy for lack of a better phrase being present yeah. for people in the room and not trying to push them on a stage so they piss their pants or overpower them with your personality like your tom cruise or whatever or, or and also being present for yourself there's a lot of characters in this movie who like finally come to terms with their own shit or the shit their parents gave them so being and so then tying that into the theme of fate and destiny, I mean, I think the idea is we can only be present for ourselves because frogs might fall from the sky tomorrow. Like there's no, there's nothing more we can do with it. Like I do think fate is a key and destiny is a key part of this, but I think he's trying to say, be there for yourself and be there for other people because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Like none of it is promised. You might get hit by a frog. I mean, it feels, it feels like just a massive tool for empathy, like have yes. empathy of course you know what i mean yeah. and and i mean it goes down the line for every character in here the search yeah. or the 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 finding of empathy for every single and one forgiveness. of forgiveness yes forgiveness. i mean like yeah not forgiveness necessarily, yeah. not necessarily awful father characters forgiveness of yourself like yeah, Donnie I mean, william h macy needs to forgive himself tj mackie needs to forgive himself as julianne stuff. moore needs to forgive herself yes. you know what i mean yeah, yeah. and i mean moore that's explained pretty explicitly with the john c Riley monologue at the end through the lens yes. of policing which I think yes. is a good mm -hmm. sort of encapsulation I mean, of Philip Baker Hall is essentially going from his wife and his daughter asking for forgiveness, knowing that death is knocking at the door. You know what I mean? It's, I mean, it's, it's not going to change till you wise up is like yeah. wise up about yourself and your life yeah. and where you are and become aware of. And that's the, that song is a key turning point in the movie where these characters do become smarter because they pay attention to themselves and their own feelings. We're so trained, especially in the nineties to like, tamp down our feelings and be tj mackie who's not a feeling at all he's just a presence he's just a personality and this movie i think is pt and, and also of course boogie nights is about larger than life personalities so pt anderson made a movie about as as broad and crazy as it is is really just about sitting on the edge of somebody's bed and talking to them until they smile and look at the camera like i mean that's where it ends it lands in a very personal quiet moment <laughs> Where, where P.T. Anderson drops down the volume of what Riley's saying, mm -hmm. focuses only on the person hearing, not the person talking. It's just a close-up of Melora Walters, which I think is such an incredible choice. We hear the music more than we hear what Riley is saying. Uh, so we're focused on a face. We're focused on a person. And then that face looks directly at us and smiles. Like It's just such a really powerful, this is it. This, this human interaction, this human emotion doesn't need words could maybe use some music but it's literally just this is all we got and that's where he lands his movie and i think it's one of his best endings yeah really for some reason i can't and I, i'm trying to explain it I'm not sure i'm doing a good job but oh, I you're think doing that great ending, man 
Yeah, you're doing that good. That ending is one of his best in terms mm-hmm. of like, I get it all now. Well, he's I'm just not even the, sure what he, I get. He's just the master of a of an ending, though. He's yeah, he's got. Yeah, great that's what I think. It's it's the cleansing. It's the reset. It's yes. like okay, I am sort of absolving every one of their sins in this moment, mm-hmm, and right. realizing that I am capable of happiness. Right. She she ne- she barely. I'm not sure she smiles one other time in the movie, and she looks directly at us and smiles. And I I hadn't seen this movie in ten years, and I remembered that smile. Mm-hmm. There's something about that shot, that final shot, that really sticks with me. It's one of my favorite in his entire history, his entire career. When we, the when the credits started, I did I did rewind and go back and turn the subtitles on to see what to see if they did yeah. put uh, subtitles for the John C. Riley dialogue, and they did. And it's yeah. super mundane, unimportant dialogue, but it's just this idea of someone speaking to her with some really? sort of admiration and uh, love that just completely reorients her perspective on everything she also does right. so much cocaine in this movie i don't know what a lot of cocaine is but i feel like that is a lot of cocaine yeah i mean i mean a lot of cocaine is also what happens at boogie nights too they do a lot of That's cocaine true. in that movie as well That's too. True. um speaking of a lot of cocaine she did a lot in boogie nights uh jay you want to talk about julianne Moore? yeah julian i mean I, they, they, <laughs> we, there is- this is a debate we've had you and I for a long, long time about this performance. I, I will say this. I was a much bigger fan of, of her performance this time than, than yeah. I have been. I Good. have thought occasionally Good. that her, <laughs> her performance in this is an absolute disaster. I definitely <laughs> did not think that this time. I think I appreciated more of the melodrama in this movie yeah. uh, this time around. And I think some of that came from the fact that, again, you have... Philip Seymour Hoffman saying stuff like this is the part in the movie where you help me out or um, this, this idea of this heightened um, storytelling, which is really just, that's what making movies is about. I mean, this takes it to kind of another level, but it is this idea that we're not going to most of the time, we're not going to tell you the boring stuff that happened. We're going to tell you the really interesting stuff that happens. And this is taking it to kind of a maximalist level and so when you have Julian Moore giving kind of a maximalist performance in this movie, I think it does kind of tie things together. And also I think it is a halfway decent representation of this uh, pharmaceutical haze that, that people yeah. can get into. Um, I agree. Again, I think it's heightened, um, but, but Julian Moore is, is pretty good at that. So Ryan, I'm sorry to disappoint. I think it's it's good. Pretty pretty good. Good. I mean, imagine Call me imagine lady. reading this imagine reading this script. Like all the different melodramatic beats in this thing, like all the grief points, all the bullet points of characters. Yeah. Is it any wonder she brought melodrama? Like no. she went for the she went for the ceiling in a few scenes and I, I will say even this time watching it again this morning, she doesn't make the biggest impact on me from this film either way. Yeah. So I, I think she's fine, but she's not the the face or the character I remember. No, she's just, she's just got that great monologue that I love at the yeah. drugstore, which is just incredible. Yeah. And you call me lady. You call me lady. <laughs> I do. I come here. <laughs> I give you these things. Like I, 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 I have still sickness. Love it. I, I don't know I, if I'm supposed to kind of laugh at some of that, but I, 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 so, I think so. I think yeah. so. Go over the top. I think yeah. also though, it's a person that is just. Like for me, this time watching it, just just on basic level, not camp, not how it's been taken by the internet or whatever. Just as the character, I felt exactly what she was feeling in that moment. Because we would all be like, "Why the fuck are you asking me questions?" He was asking some this. very inappropriate it's like, questions. Come on, Pat. Like seriously, why are you asking me all these questions? Wow, this is a lot of stuff. Yeah, this, what's going on? And he you? kept saying that like multiple times. At a certain point, you'd be like, "Motherfucker, just shut up!" Like, it's not even for me. Like, I'm not going to have a party. And it, if you reach a certain point, and I found her, I found their her part of that storyline to be just at least up until like the car stuff, and and then she goes to the hospital yeah. and everything. I think the first half of it is just really good because, yeah. for the most part, it almost felt like weirdly this quasi continuation of the amber jack connection and relationship that they had in boogie nights where it is this older man and it is this woman and it's almost the the flip of this where she is with this older man 
and she's with him for the money. But as he's gotten sick, as they've talked less and less, right? Because they don't even have a line of dialogue together or or really a, a conversation, right? She's become more and more in love with him and feels extremely guilty for taking advantage of him in the first place and the years of doing that and to rewrite the will and to get um you know frank or jack or however you want to call him out of the will tom cruise out of the will and out of his life it almost feels like that's still a part of the driving force and that she was a part of that and then by the end she feels guilty and but yet she feels also guilty but at the same time fully invested right as he's on his deathbed into the man that she loves and i find that complexity to be fascinating because i think it really works with the with the lawyer i don't i I works at the drugstore um like i think when she's just i think it's like the third person that she sees no it's the doctor that she sees and then it's the drugstore and then the lawyer scene that's a little bit more shaky ground for me in that scene where she just like leaves like that um but her stuff with philip seymour hoffman when she comes back to the house And she's just like, you cannot do that because at that point it's the, the history of that relationship, but then also it's her last moments and she, she has ownership in those. And I thought this time around, I was like, no, Moore's fantastic in this. And she's, she's really, really good. She's not in like Amber waves territory of how great she is in boogie nights, but she's delivering great stuff. But I agree with you, Brian, she's not, who I go to and think about it, you know, I thought about Philip Baker Hall. I thought about Robarts. Um, I thought about there's William a gentleman H. by the name of Tom Cruise in this film. I was going to say gives quite Tom, a good performance. Thomas Cruise, that's really good. I who mean, is literally presented as the monolith from 2001 as his introduction <laughs> to this movie. Working in the same year with Kubrick in Eyes Wide Shut, which I found to be really just kind of a wonderful on the nose sort of thing. I mean, I was texting a friend of mine today. And I was just like, why didn't Tom Cruise win the Oscar for this? Because like now this is maybe his best performance. Like if you want to say that, like I. His last I, great one. His last, well, collateral. Is that right? Collateral exists. Yeah, but that's not in this caliber. No. I would put Eyes Wide Shut in this caliber and I would yeah. put maybe, I would put Born on the Fourth of July in this caliber and i would maybe put jerry Maguire for what it is in this caliber but so he had that stretch in the 80, late 80s early 90s he's also insanely underrated in rain man by the way and i, I love him would, i love him in a few good men i think he just like the, yeah so he, he's he that has run known, from yeah. he has that run from color of money to here it's yeah really phenomenal um yeah. and now he's he actually star where he could have won two or three yeah we're being honest with ourselves and he didn't win any and then i think what happened was he worked he's he's kind of saw a different side of his career taking off and he made that choice he doesn't work with the ptas and the kubricks anymore. no he doesn't give himself over to filmmakers anymore no he stopped well, kind of doing collateral that might be the last of those yeah and i i love collateral yeah. um but i would put that in this league performance wise but the, but i'm trying to think of the last challenging filmmaker he worked with it's probably that one it's probably yeah, yeah i mean spielberg probably with sure. well no that's after isn't that the, the two spielbergs are before collateral yeah collateral is oh four war of the worlds is oh five so yeah that was oh, like the, right. that was the run that was the run yeah, okay. it was like his his last he's ones there or ben stiller yeah. tropic thunder no i'm just kidding yeah that's I'm just, I'm just, well it was really it was really the I'm the oprah kidding. jumping on the couch thing that broke him i mean and that's that the, it. that is well i think it's also if he yeah. if he had won an oscar for this or people had recognized that eyes white shut as a masterpiece things might have been a little different like yeah. I do think he yeah. didn't get he didn't get the same success from this as he did from Mission Impossible movies. And he only wants to do things that are super successful. I think that's really it. But he also kind of understands what plays in a movie theater now. Yeah. yeah, but I think also too, he's he's making things that he knows that he's like the only one that could is one of the only people left that can get a, something like that made. And those yeah. are they are completely oh. his creation. He makes Tom you know Cruise I mean? movies now. Yeah. And he, I, I love them, but I also yeah. miss when he worked with Kubrick and Stone. And oh, I know. I mean, I mean, there was that rumor a couple of years ago that he was potentially uh, the Cliff Booth, um, like Tarantino oh, yeah. wrote that uh, role. No, no, it was a version. third guy, wasn't it? It was a. It was originally going to be, or three maybe it was like guys. a three guy, a third Booth. guy. Yeah. I, well, I mean, it I just makes sense for friend to that. to play like the yeah. stuntman. Tom but, like, Cruise he was, was definitely supposed to be in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, and initially yeah. early on, and I think that that would have been like. Oh my god. 
Is that a good oh my god? Or a, yeah, exactly. No, right? Who doesn't want to? He would chew the scenery out of a Tarantino movie. And also, those are two populist people that should work together. That that makes total sense. That's a marriage of a film. But the problem is, it's almost like the Will Smith and and like Django and Chain thing. Does Tom Cruise is he willing to give over a lot of the control to a filmmaker anymore? And he certainly yeah. was here. In yeah. this in this era, he's the auteur of his movies now. Yes, now, and you know. may, that might change. I mean, he might shift again. He's shifted. I would a think few he times would change a little bit with like Macquarie because Macquarie's not like some no. you know like rent for hired guy. He he knows his but, shit. But if I mean? Tarantino offers him a great part in the critic, would he take it? I think he might. Could he I play think the he might. Tom Cruise as the critic? Uh-huh. <laughs> I think that's supposed to be a young part actually. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but my point is, I I hope. We haven't seen the last of this cruise. As crazy as it sounds, like given his one of the biggest stars in history, I think Tom Cruise is underrated. I think Tom Cruise is a phenomenal performer. I think he mm-hmm. should have won at least two Oscars. And I think people take him for granted in terms of his range. And and he's incredible in this movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, he understands every beat of this character, what each scene needs. I mean, he brought as much to this as he does to the Mission Impossible stuff in terms of like what I'm he he brings his as much as he does with Ethan Hunt he brings Tom Cruise to this character like we see Tom we see the the big star the larger than life character and then we see him tear it down i miss the tom cruise who's willing to tear it down tear, i mean this and eyes wide shut are both about super masculine men who think they have control over everything and then it disappears yes. yeah. and, and they're a phenomenal pair of films and performances that i don't think got as much credit as they should have so, do you yeah. think that it's also maybe i mean the divorce, Scientology yeah. of it all—that's got to play factors into There's all this lot. too. It's I mean, a lot. It's I'm not, not going to play it's armchair not a, psychologist on that, but no, I mean, I mean, it, that's it that's our other podcast. That's next week. Brian will be on that one. It'll yeah, be a yeah, whole yeah, thing. Yeah. You know, it's six hundred dollars. Hollywood a psychologist. Yeah, somebody's going to make I that think, podcast. I think one of the roots was more successful. I mean, yeah. you can't say Magnolia and Eyes Wide Shut weren't, weren't critically acclaimed. They were, but he didn't win the Oscar, and he was off making blockbusters. He realized he could make Mission Impossible movies, yeah, and Tom Cruise movies, and be he, Tom Cruise only wants to succeed. But the, the but the audience like changed, pages. right, Brian? The audience yeah. changes because of like yeah, Jerry Maguire. Like Jerry Maguire yeah. a movie that makes a shit ton of money. You know, A Few Good Men makes a shit ton of money. Like Born in the Fortress of Lies made decent money. Rain Man made decent money. Like these movies, oh, no, but yeah. But, but times have changed completely. Exactly. But also, so he, he could have kept making Steven Spielberg movies, but he cratered the press for War of the Worlds, and Steve Spielberg was just like, "I'm not working with this guy anymore." Yeah, he he destroyed that relationship. Like, yeah, and yeah. you know, and and but now it's like because he's because of the Maverick success and everything, and you know, I don't know. Oh, his his Q score has almost never been it, higher than it it's is never right been now. like higher than probably like in this era. And so he kind of, you know, it goes in waves, right? Um, but at least Leo, I'll say this about like, because I think that, you know, everyone always says that like Cruz is the number one guy. And I'm like, well, I think Leo is the number one guy because like Leo can still get a big draw and is a big name and can get a movie like Hollywood or The Revenant or Wolf of Wall Street to make a shit ton of money. And yet he, you know, doesn't always have to go to the theaters. He can do on the streamers too. And he he's found a good balance. I mean, these Mission Impossible movies well, aren't going to make will never any do money. A streamer, you ever. know, you don't never say never, never say never. Because if somebody offers him like, I, don't, I mean, I don't he, think he would. I mean, these Mission but. Impossible movies right now, they, because of the COVID delays, because of the strike and everything, they've they're not going to make any money for the studio whatsoever. But they're in bed with them. He, you know, he made he saved cinemas. He brought everybody back with Maverick. I mean, and, he did, and then Mission Impossible quasi flopped. But, but I do think he he could, if it's somebody. I mean, it's not going to be Paul Thomas Anderson because, like, of the whole like the master thing. Maybe I don't know. Maybe that was overblown. Uh, I think conf- so. Some people say that it was overblown. Some people say it was. It just depends on probably the movie. I but, think. I think if PTA wrote him a good part, he'd take it. I think. I think if, he would. I think if Nolan came to him and said, "I've got a oh, really man. interesting idea for you," he'd take it. How I would think, you not? I think, well, yeah. because he doesn't seem to want to challenge himself anymore. But yeah. if he ever turned a corner and then brought that, once he can't jump out of a plane anymore, which as much as I hate to say it, Tom Brady did eventually retire. There will eventually come a time when the guy has to stop doing it. All good Toms come to an end. 
That's right. All good times come to an end. Said that's by a Falcons fan that's right the there. Name of our, that's the name of our podcast here. All good times come to an end. <laughs> where we're going to break down. We're going to break down the careers of Tom Hanks, Tom Brady, and Tom Cruise. Um, <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> that actually is a really good idea. You're you're getting us good ideas on this show. Um, but no, I mean, oh. like, I mean, like, yeah, it almost like what you were talking about him, Brian. I kept thinking about Harrison Ford too yeah i thought about another four, actor who doesn't challenge himself yeah uh, but also another actor that is like insanely underrated too just because of like yep. he made a lot of genre movies and they were really great but he also has really fantastic performances and he only has like one oscar nomination and he you know he's clearly well, like because he stopped working with interesting people too i exactly, mean there's you know. tons of examples of great performers who stopped working with people who challenged them meryl yeah. streep has worked with like one or two challenging directors in the last 25 years she works with people <laughs> she can work easily yeah with. meryl streep started making meryl streep movies that's what she yeah, said exactly Same and, as and Cruz. um yeah. i mean as much as i think Two of his best performances in entire life are De Niro and Irishman and De Niro and Flower Moon. And he's made nothing but shit around those movies. So okay. he often chooses to, to work with people who don't. Here, somebody challenge. didn't see Bad Grandpa. I was going to say, no, that's Dirty Grandpa. <laughs> is that right. Dirty Grandpa? Sorry. Is it, the is bad it Grandpa dirty? is the is Johnny Knoxville one? Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah. I think you're right. I think yeah. you're right. I think or Dirty Fighting with my family. Yeah, right. There are is that, great no... performers out there who Which just choose. To not challenge themselves at certain yeah. points. Which was the it, De Niro one where he uh where he fighting with uh, his grandkid? Uh I fucked my grandpa. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. That's there what it you was. go. Put it on the post of Brian Tellerico. Four stars, out, Roger com. There you go. Shout out to Cruz. He gets the signature a man putting his crotch in a woman's face uh shot in this yes, one. He does. The the PTA special. When, is that when uh like he walking away for the interview? Yeah, and, and she you like can't see his back. head, but her head is center frame. Yeah, and exactly. yeah. just the, the, it's it's well, the PTA signature. Exactly. Well, it's I it's will a, say, yeah. at least I don't think Cruz is like resting on his residuals as much as like De Niro is when he's not working with Scorsese or John Cusack or all these other people who just kind of gave up after a while. Listen, but I don't think Robert just, De Niro is 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 living in the poorhouse. Right? No. No, but my point is Cruz at least is trying to, if he's going to do blockbusters, he's going to fucking do blockbusters. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like he's not phoning it in. He's just not yeah. choosing challenging performances. Like yeah. like Jay said a couple of times, he's making Tom Cruise movies, not PTA movies, not Stanley Kubrick movies, not Michael Mann movies, not yeah. Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. I think he's going to, he's going to break a hip or something and he's going to end up having to like work, you know, and then, and then it'll be interesting. Maybe like when he's like 70. 75 oh, yeah. that's when he gets to make like his interesting shit again you know what i mean i think i will go on the record i think tom cruise's oscar is still coming I oh i fun. oh i totally agree they will the, the they, part that's even close they will want to reward him for decades of billions of dollars he gets yeah. a good part it doesn't even have to be like pta it could be like i don't know one of those stephen freers it could be like one of those like <laughs> reliable <laughs> Oscar Beatty directors Shit. who gets him just the right part when he's in his seventies and yeah. he gets it finally. It no, I, I mean it's he he'll get his King Richard. Exactly, he'll get his minus the it, slap. Well, it'll be yeah. later than that, but yeah, yeah, he'll get. Although he'll never, do, I don't think he'd do something. But you know, biopic but, but you but, but you know what I mean, mean. like like he well, no, he gets he gets an rules. easy run where he yeah, sweeps something. everything, and it's a yes, it's a it's like we don't even need to have a conversation about best actor. He's in it, done, finished. Tom Cruise as, as the older to mentor the character. He will get his color yeah. of money. Ooh, he will get his should... color of money, which finally won Newman his Oscar. Mm -hmm. yeah. He will get that part someday, and he'll re relive that prophecy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. the second Hustler sequel. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, the color, color of color Maverick. Of yeah, color it's actually a, yeah, the cover <laughs> the color of Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, but no, I think he's. I think he, no. In all honesty, I think he's fantastic. I think that the, the part itself, the way it's written, it's fucking absurd and insane. It's it of all the characters. Yes, it is the completely over the top character, but it's written that way because of hiding all those insecurities that you're talking about jay what you're talking about yeah. brian of just this this when you start peeling back the onion in that interview because i think the interview is a fantastic sequence when he just sh shuts down and mm -hmm. breaking the facade of not only just these people in general but just the idea of this guy who tried to reinvent his life to get away from what he then has to confront at the end of the film 
which is all the pain and the trauma that is caused by this man. And this man at the same time is narrating a huge chunk of this film. Um, it feels like that middle in that middle section of just what he did to get to this point to the meet by the end. And I just, every time Cruz goes, I'm not going to cry for you. You son of a bitch. I just, it just works. It's so good. And yeah. I and I don't and I agree. I just don't. That's why every time you say, "Yeah," but I mean, I talk about this. an Oscar clip. Yeah, I mean, like it, that's I the mean, thing. It's the like you watch it and you go, "I know that's there. It's still there, and somebody can tap into it." And that's why I think we always talk about the promise or the or the idea of Cruz going back to something like this because yeah. he is that good. He is one of the best actors on the planet when he is given the material to do so. It's not just about jumping out of a helicopter and everything. It is about, like you're mentioning, Brian, this movie, two people, maybe three, in a room talking about their feelings. Yeah. And that is something that he refuses to do. But in this era, he did... And it was beautiful. Like it, yeah. this is beautiful work from what you would expect from somebody of a superstar at the height of their powers, making box office hits that also get nominated for a ton of Oscars saying, right. I want to work with that cocky motherfucker that made boogie nights. And he's going to entrust me this larger than life character, but I'm going to find an amazing amount of pathos to him. And I just and 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 I I think, yeah, it, I think it is his best performance. You it's know, one of my favorite line readings of his is in the movie at the end after he's been frazzled from the interview, mm. and he's in that how to fake like you are nice and caring part, right. and he's talking about like what women think of men, and I think it's just a flub, but he just goes, they say we are heinous, and then he pauses and then just goes heinous. I just think that's such an interesting little thing in the movie. I assume it was just a mistake, but I don't think so. I think because I, I I read it as he doesn't. He's the kind of kind of guy who uses words he doesn't know what they mean, and he, <laughs> or he doesn't know how to pronounce them. Like you know, uh, that's that's all, good. Yeah, guys, we've, we've we've seen dumb podcasters and toxic masculinity people who use words Ooh. and they have no idea what. They if it is, if it Shots is not, us. if it is that's... not a mistake, it is incredible actually Change. because it Brian, seems so natural Brian just shot fire like a lot at us and i just i just want to go on the, the toxic masculinity we don't know we what are the hell. we are we are i am often referred to as the joe rogan of the movie world I mean, yeah we are complete dum-dums so i don't know what you're i don't know what you signed up here for but uh but what do you think joe I, rogan thinks of magnolia i don't give a shit how about that <laughs> um, <laughs> um Macho shit. No, not enough. He, yeah, he'd be like, he's the Frank T.J. Mackey of our time. So uh, these frogs, I saw this in this movie the other night, and um, yeah, uh, no, I would fucking hate to find out. Anyway, uh, no, he's he's fantastic in this, and yeah, I mean, I do love the line. The second time he says it is is great, but the first time too of if they if those dogs come in anywhere near me, oh yeah, that's so kick funny. the shit out of them. Because yeah. it's like the facade is still not even down, but the minute he walks in there, he's that little kid again. He's that guy yep. that's that had to take care of his mother. He's the guy that had to be a, the man, watch her die, and now yep. he has to do it all over again. Yep. And he's as soon as he walks in, and, and and Phil asks him, "Hey, do you want to do you want to come in here?" And he has to just take a second. And he's like, "No, I'm just going to take a beat. He's like, give me, brilliant. give me, give me a minute. I Absolutely need to, brilliant. Right? I need to tear down my." persona here and get back into my own mind mm. yeah is there a is there a subplot for you guys in this movie maybe a character or somebody that doesn't work because i no. because in movies like this there is always one right like in these interconnective I mean, there are some that are better than others but like i would say like the stuff with the kid is my is is what grew oh, on they, me this go round. Oh, I think oh, okay. that stuff is critical as sort of the cyclical yeah. nature of the movie. I, yeah, yeah. I used to not like it, but then I I actually really really loved it this go round. Just and then how it uh, weaves into um to Donnie's. Sort I would of say if there's a end, weakest but, element, I would say it's probably Donnie. Maybe. Yeah, he's yeah, so good though. He's, he's so good. So good. I, I'm 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 grasping at straws a little bit when I the say the scene that. with Riley and the kid in the street. 
the kid raps struck yeah. me as a little awkward this time. Yeah, it was a little like awkwardly staged and. You think PTA wrote that? He, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wait, Brian, but, is but this is this when you really, introduce your really rap? To show? We're nitpicking on small stuff in terms <laughs> yeah. of like. No, we really I are. Mean, some of the stuff at the bar with Donnie goes on a little too long, I guess. Oh, um, you know what is kind of a weird thing? The Marcy dead guy in a closet <laughs> narrative. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Which well, is such an interesting thread that just sort of goes away. No, it's randomness shit. It's you could you can come to someone's house and there's a dead guy in the closet. You can oh, lose your Marcy, dog. what's in here? <laughs> yeah, it's totally like I think it sets up the oh hey weird shit's gonna happen because it's yeah. one of the early yeah. like hey, yeah the, he, he's going on an ordinary and I also think it puts him on edge because mm. he gets all from that moment on he's like things feel weird. Do you know what I mean? Like there's mm -hmm. a it, it kind of does something to Riley's performance in that character after that sequence where he's kind of like man can you believe the fucking day i had <laughs> he's in one of those kind of <laughs> states when when you're in that kind of state in other words things get heightened for him which makes him mm -hmm. i think jump at the melora walters opportunity a little more because i think there's a sense of oh hey i could be in a really dangerous situation so i should yeah. go back and ask her out so i do think it has a plot function to it as well maybe he doesn't turn around and go chase that guy who's running down the sidewalk or something right exactly yeah well yeah it kind of like i said creates this weird unpredictable tension in his character mm -hmm. and in his subplot. Yeah. It is weird when she shows up later when she's getting her mug shot, I think. Just and then that's kind of the last we see of her. Yeah. yeah. It's just kind of an interesting thing. Apparently it was a much bigger part of this original script. Huh. Okay. I wonder how big that original script was. Jay, do you it's know how big that original script was? massive paperweight like the, like the, the limit James the limit Bible. does not exist <laughs> that was yeah. actually it's still being written he just hasn't right. stopped you right. imagine like every 10 years he's just writing extra stuff in there and you're just like longer Shit, than stop the it. Na longer than the napoleon director's cut oh for god Ooh. there's a there's an eight hour assembly cut of magnolia brian you, you saw you saw napoleon right i'm not big on napoleon which yeah. makes me sad because i'm a big ridley scott guy i know i'm two stars on napoleon it's a promote the site the reviews on the front page now napoleon two stars out of four and it's all about how sad i am because i'm a big ridley scott guy but i do think the four hour director's cut could be better most of my issues with napoleon are it kind of is clunky and unwieldy in terms of pacing and timing and tone so if he has time to spread that out i actually think it could work and i'm just oh. not sure why they released why why did they let him film a four-hour movie and then release the Cl cliff notes clunky unwieldy version of it you can't That's cage the riddler we've done this many yeah. times studios yeah <laughs> they, they really no i really like seriously when we were when, on our review that's up on the website as well right now um uh, sophia talked about like this is like kingdom of heaven all over again every fucking time we so. do this shit no we do this shit yeah. every fucking time yeah. like there's a long ass cut of this stuff like just release the long cut because you want to know why before the world started bitching about three hour movies, Paul Thomas Anderson made a three hour and eight minute movie. And you know what? Everybody fucking couldn't sh stop talking about it. This was don't, relatively don't. divisive when it came out. To but people clear. were talking about it. They don't weren't saying all oh, it's a long movie discourse. Don't I will lose my mind. <laughs> I will go insane. But you know, but you know what I'm saying? Is it like, well, we this have Punch Drunk Love coming up right after this. Yeah, so. so, you know, pretty brief episode, actually. Robert is only going to be on there for like five minutes. But um, <laughs> is that the, the length of the episode is, is tied to the length of the film? Yeah. No, I, Percentage I'll was? my soapbox for 10 seconds and say everyone who complains about the length of Pillars of the Flower Moon watches 10 hours of Stranger Things in a weekend and doesn't say a goddamn word about it. And I lose my mind. Like, no, just shut, up. shut up. Shut yeah, up. I agree. Because this one doesn't feel three hours and six minutes or whatever it is remote. It's very it propulsive. It's very, it's propulsive. very, especially for such a talky film. Same like with most same with Boogie Nights. Are, yeah, that's, yeah, that's he's, 240. He's got, he, I mean, that's the thing of all of his movies. None of them feel long. Like there's a momentum to every single one of them that is just ridiculous. Um, and one of his incredible skill sets is pacing it's rhythm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the timing of his films. But yeah. but it's so interesting that Boogie Nights is so much fun for half of the movie and this is just yeah. about a bunch of sad sacks and it's still <laughs> yeah. yeah it's about a bunch of sad sacks but yet you can't just like help but like just be on the edge of your seat and just like yeah you know when he drops the the you know the the ne needle drops or he's going all the different stories that are going like everything's so interesting so it invites you in it's not 
it's not fun and alluring as like going to the party at Jack's house in the backyard, but it is as interesting as anything that's in that movie because you're just like, damn, all these characters are so sad. Why are they sad? Why did they get to this point? Like you, and then the the opening of this movie invites you in to try to understand then the puzzle that he's putting together and yeah. and try to form an opinion. Like this movie is not. I mean, it, it does spoon feeds a lot of things to the audience, but by the end, it's like, okay, I've done enough of the work for you. You need to figure the rest of this shit out by yourself. And I, and I appreciate that because it goes back to his patience in making the film, but then also just allowing that to then uh, like the audience to take this in on this journey. I think, I think the prologue also very much sets up, expect the unexpected, yeah, which keeps you going. In other words, some, dude might fall out of a plane or get shot while they're trying to commit suicide or or hey we might break into a musical number for an amy man song or drop frogs from this guy like there's a yeah. sense mm-hmm. one of the propulsive elements of it is while it's so talky you know something weird's gonna happen you yeah. don't have yes exactly it does feel like a crescendo or yeah. or a, yeah where it is just leading up to something you don't right. know what it is and I will say in that in that name and book again, and this might be just me being an idiot and not ever really realizing this before, but the prologue, all three of those things are about people falling from the sky, which I think is interesting. You've got oh, yeah. people who are getting hung. You have the guy yeah. who is dropping from the plane, and then you have the guy who's jumping off the roof. That uh, which that's is, my which favorite. Is a nice bit. kind of in hindsight, a nice little foreshadowing stuff going on. Yeah. And there is all the eighty two stuff for Exodus chapter eight verse two for the the frogs and and, and stuff yep. like that um yeah. which I, I think i think that might be a little cute but yeah. um it's it's there for you to kind of un- d- discover it's very reddit well, board i mean i mean we could get into the fact that the character who seems to have the most positive outlook on life is seen praying and talking about god more than once john c Riley's character is a religious character yes yeah. so there there is a argument to be made that this is a pro-faith film that that the, the the believer is the one who seems to be not only happy himself but provides salvation for another character at the end. I mean, he's he's no he's notorious for his. I mean, a couple of films that we'll talk about in the next couple of weeks, just exploring faith and exploring the the the, the complexities of that, whether it's whether it's Christianity or whether it's something else. You know what I mean? Right. And right. so. I mean, this is a, this is one of one of the great strengths of this film is that it is an it is an utterly non judgmental movie. No, it doesn't. It's again, it goes back to empathy. It, it's a movie that has empathy for all the characters. It's it's and forgiveness and forgiveness and and allows you the time to understand why they deserve or don't deserve to have that forgiveness. Well, if you look and, at perhaps the greatest act of mercy in the movie, it is whatever powerful powerful force you want to apply as the proponent of these frogs falling from the sky jimmy gator is going to kill himself and a frog moves the gun away from his head as if to say you don't need to do this to yourself yeah even though he is the closest thing to a truly evil figure in the movie uh which i think is really interesting that's a twist too when i and you know i always i always forget about that that right. stuff with with philip baker hall and in his cycle of abuse that he has and in in you know just also too because i love philip baker hall and the last time you see him yeah, in a P- they, P- well, they, pta movie he's talking about like butter in his ass and then like now he's like i'm a giant piece of shit and i and you don't I, foreshadow it very much you expect him to be like the one who's gonna help the kid on the show and be supportive. And then mm-hmm. suddenly, Oh no, he's also human trash. Yeah. Um, deeply fucked up. Yeah. No. Yeah. But so why do the, why does the frog save him? Is it fate? Is it God? Is it something else? And I think what's fascinating about this movie is that he doesn't come down on any of those answers. Mm-hmm. It lets you decide if he doesn't get to kill himself because so he's forgiven by some higher power or if it's just randomness. Mm-hmm. Um, or he doesn't get to kill himself because that's too easy, and he's got to deal with his shit. Doesn't I mean, that's too. I mean, yeah. the other thing goes to Donnie as well. Like the frogs prevent him from getting away with that money, and right. it, then and then turn also uh, forces uh, Jim John C. Riley to be in his. That's a police officer, so he's not going to be able to get away. And what are they doing? 
There's not, I'm taking you to jail. There's no any of that. It's just like, this is not the easy way. Like, the easy way out is not going to make you happy. It's not going to fix you. You know, I love, I mean, I th- yeah, William H. Basie. I mean, just, I have a lot of love to give the whole. I miss him whole, so much. I miss him uh, so much. Him working miss, as a character actor like that. Just incredible. Oh my run God. in the 90s. It's such a great run. It was unreal, uh, man. Like, I'm old enough to remember it as it was unfolding. And it was just, he was like, oh my God, everything he does is going to be interesting. Like, it had that. And of yeah. course, Hoffman had that too. It's yeah. just like, oh my God, every time I see these dudes, I'm going to be excited. And who's that now? Who do we have that's doing William H. Macy and Philip Seymour Hoffman character work? Maybe like, like, maybe like every, Stol- Stolbarg, maybe? He's not working a lot. But he I doesn't think. work as much. Yeah. No, nowhere near as much. <laughs> But he's a yeah. He had it for a little while there. He had a little yeah. run. Yeah. I'm worried now that the cones seem pretty much retired that we're going to lose our character actors completely. No, so. I, no, I agree. I mean, like yeah. that's been like kind of the great thing over the last couple of years of seeing like certain people, and especially like watching Barry over the last couple of years, seeing like Stephen Root get his sure. like his his you know deserved time in the sun and and everything. But yeah, I mean. Well, yeah, goes back to, they're all going. They're all going to TV. Like, like oh, yeah, I mean, but that's why Macy did Chainless for twelve years. It yeah. was a decent character, and it was a good paycheck. It was a good yeah. paycheck. So, like, and yeah. but I mean, it goes back to what you're saying, Brian. Like, somebody needs to make a giant. I mean, they need to make a, a movie like this. But the problem is, it's like okay, it's either the television series, like you're mentioning, or it's something like Oppenheimer, where it's a hundred million dollars. Well, and, no, really, really, no. what William H Macy is waiting for is his holdovers, kind of, right? Yeah. Well, Payne, yeah, okay, Payne's doing it a little. Payne's bit. doing it a little yeah. bit, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good. That's. I a mean, good like I said earlier, I know it was a joke, but like McKay is essentially making all these things, and they're terrible. But I mean, he's yes, I understand. Yeah, you know, we all want to blow our brains out, and that's you know, but but what I'm saying is, is he's getting these giant ensembles making these films like this. Do they yeah. say anything remotely as interesting as a fraction of this movie? No, but he's getting carte blanche by streamers and studios to do it, and he's getting rewarded for it. So, I mean, it is out there. It's I just got, not. I, I, it's just not out go. there to I the. Really, ex- I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> but it's. Not it the, was pretty awesome. The, I mean, Ryan. Ryan. To be fair, when Adam McKay told me. The global warming is actually bad. That is true. I didn't that was know. Powerful. I mean, you didn't that know was that. Potent. And I and what about what about when he told you Dick Cheney was a piece of shit? Like we didn't know that before. See, I, I never used to I, think he was like a pretty cool guy. Yeah, I thought I'd go hunting with him a little bit. Like I didn't, I didn't think it was. Remember when he like see, he seemed chill? Remember when they had that scene where they were like, oh, "We're going to do a heart transplant," and there was nothing inside there. Because he's a heartless. Remember, when, remember when that movie got nominated for Best Picture and I screamed loudly <laughs> into the void, and that into void the- was what blew up the world at the end of. The- oh my god! <laughs> if we landed on Adam McKay as the current PTA, no, I'm not saying the- that. I'm just saying like you're talking you can about get movies-, movies made with a strong character yeah, actor yeah. cast. Yeah, yeah. He's Tarantino, got- Tarantino, for maybe sure. Payne. And, I mean, I uh, would love to see because he hasn't done it in a long, long time. I mean, like, I guess like Licorice Pizza is kind of the closest thing we've oh, yeah. had to it since. Sure. But I would like to see something along the lines of like him find the new character actors or find the actors of this generation. You know, Licorice Pizza was that, but yeah. that's a few years ago now. There are guys that can do it. There's like ten. There's like ten people that can do it. Fincher yeah. could do it if he wanted to. Well, Fincher easily could do that. That's what Zodiac is. You know. Yeah, but Zodiac's 15 years, years old now. I know Six, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess he could, yeah, in his own way. In the darker register. I mean, Gone, but... Gone Girl is is that. Yeah. Although that movie's kind of older yeah. now, too. But... I mean, like, that's the thing, is is projects on the horizon. I don't know what they are, man. Yeah. I'm getting scared. I'm getting... <laughs> no. No, we also sound like a bunch of old men on, on like, the porch. Oh, hey, know. old men, I mean, like I, they I, used I, to. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. Avengers has got a lot of great character actors in it. Yes, yes, They're all trapped in there. Yes, yep. Uh, and then even I hate to be this guy, and even in TV, it's disappearing. Oh, and Wes Barry, Anderson. Barry's obviously. done. Saul is done. Oh, Wes Anderson can do it. That's, Wes yeah. Anderson can give character actors juicy parts when he wants to. That's a like, good pull. Yeah, because like Jeffrey Wright goes into Asteroid City, has like one one scene, and he rocks the house. Or Tilda Swinton has a scene, rocks yeah, the house. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, good pull, Jay. That's actually really oh. good. 
Yeah. I'm scrolling through my letterbox. Yeah, he's just, he's just finding people <laughs> right now. He's just Yeah, okay. I'm gonna look at my top of the year. I get so like Robert Eggers is doing that. I mean like Northwood's kinda of, you know, he's grabbing a bunch of people. I don't know. Uh, he's going no for to me. I don't know. Just trying I'm just uh, trying to get somebody new. Maybe that maybe we're all wrong. I mean character driven does character driven dramas. Um, is something like air count? That came out this year, like uh, me. No, it's too high concept. Too it's high like concept. true story ish kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I love all of the strangers. I don't know if you guys have seen that. I that's a very that different kind of yeah. thing, but that's character driven. I mean, Damien Chazelle like, made a Boogie Nights ripoff. Yeah, but it wasn't good. Yeah, no, Babylon's I good. Guess, but he could get that kind of thing done. Yeah, he could. He could though. get a Magnolia done. He could. Yeah. yeah, it would be bad, but he could get it done. Oh God, I don't <laughs> want to see that. I don't want to see that movie. I already right, had to we sit go. there. We're going to get in trouble real soon. The McKay people and the Chiselle people. <laughs> yeah, they're all going to be like, these fucking yeah. assholes. Do but you I would say the uh, yeah. the Magnolia yeah. Magnolia probably doesn't get made if Pulp Fiction doesn't kind of build a runway for these interweaving narrative stories yeah, but that were so popular for a decade. But he's got Boogie Nights, too. That's why it gets made, too. I know, but it's, cor- it's a culmination of kind of everything. Yeah, but... Uh, but it's not just Pulp Fiction. It's the whole... Soderbergh Smith giving giving auteurs the oh yeah for sure for sure song. the 90s yeah uh, independent yeah. cinema movement yeah 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 do you guys got anything I mean, else Fargo, Fargo, yeah, Fargo yeah. yeah the Coens are probably a big part of this as well huge. too yeah do you guys got anything else you want to talk about uh for Magnolia before we I miss Amy Mann I think her work here on the soundtrack is phenomenal oh, I love I listen to the soundtrack all the time back in 99 do you own it on like, CD I do. I still have it on CD. In fact, I know where it is. Oh. My kids been going through my old CD collection. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. You know, you can't listen to Wise Up on Spotify. It's not available. What? Really? Yeah, it's like grayed out on the soundtrack. Why? Why the hell? I don't know. It's really weird because I, I wanted to listen to it after I watched it. Yeah, and uh, Son of although my favorite song in in the movie is "Save Me" at the end, I mean, I think yeah. it's just so. That's a great song to so walk powerful out on. At the end. Yeah, that's just a great, beautiful song. song. Yeah. Great out on the soundtrack, but it's on like her greatest hits and other shit, so you can listen to it. Yeah, Jay, but, but it's not trying, on the soundtrack. Trying to get Jay, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just startled. I was like, "How is that possible?" It is weird that you can't. If you try, that's to really to the weird. Soundtrack, though, it's going to skip that song. That's that bizarre. bizarre. Yeah. So okay. Well, all right. You learn something new every day. You learn. You learn good job, Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> Fix your shit, evidently. Shout out uh, Jason Robards. I Robards. just love yes, that guy. A legend. A legend. And yeah. I mean, lots of legends gone in here. Hall Hoffman. I, I don't just miss this Riley and this. It's the kind of all the legends in this movie who are gone. Yeah, yeah, they're all gone. What's the best? What's the best Robards? Oh, um, what's, what's Pete Robards? The one he won the. Won the Oscar, the drunk one. Thousand Clowns. My Watch favorite clowns. Robards is uh have y'all seen the ballad of Cable Hogue, the Sam Peckinpah movie? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love yeah. that movie. He's so That's good, good in that. Thousand yeah, Clowns anyway. is good. I love, love I, Robards. I love it's also him great in uh, Melvin and Howard, which is a movie that PTA Yeah, he's great in that. He's great in Melvin and Howard. Yeah. He's nice. also he's also just I mean he's my favorite editor. He's um uh, well, he's pre- all the president's men. Yeah, I just love him in that movie so much. He's just so fucking good. He just just comes oh, in yeah, there all and the fucking knows. Is a good one. God, I love. Uh, we're on, I mean, I know that Back we have Billy movie the kid. I know we have. Oh yeah, he's really good. Back here, Billy the Kid, Abel Hogue. God, what a great actor. Once upon a time in the West. Yeah, how about a little yeah, movie called Once Upon a Time in the West? West. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just a little bit, a little bit. I've heard it a bit, a little bit. He's actually got it like um. He's got the, those couple of scenes in Philadelphia too that are really good. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Later on, Tony I Scott love. got him for a couple there. Yeah, T. Scott. Yes, Crimson Tide. Crimson Tide. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. Now, he Incredible was a legend. Stuff. One of those actors who was just like always present in everything he did. Like you never felt forced. He, no. he was a character again to tie it all up. He was a character actor. He I mean, created characters, and I miss that kind of acting. Yeah, going to be the old man who dismisses even the movies I love this year. I love. I mean, my tops are like Oppenheimer, of course, and um, Flower Moon and Zone of Interest. They're all high concept movies. They're not mm-hmm. character driven movies. They're not about 
Well, they've got some great performances. They've got great performances in them, but they're about spectacle more than they're about character. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. But I will say, I mean, Oppie does feel like a hundred million dollar, like the closest thing you get to that. I mean, like it is centered around that giant performance, and it's, and it's, sure. it's, it's like this person walks in, this person walks in, this person walks in, this person walks in, and they all have their moments. You know what oh, I mean? And yeah, yeah, in terms of like giving people interesting things to do character work yeah yes it's got that yeah i agree with i that. mean it's building and, to and that honestly, historic moment you know what i mean but you know speaking he, of characters in that movie uh, benny safty could do some interesting stuff for characters thinking if the creators the safty brothers could do some really interesting characters they could because they love pta they oh, love uh, they, well Bob they're Bob they're they're, they're split up now the now yeah oh, they're yeah. not yeah they're they not sharing, the cohen's they're not sharing thanksgiving meals anymore it's real sad. I'm sure that they're well, doing. I'm sure that they'll get back together. If they want. I will also say again. I kind of said this in uh, when we reviewed Boogie Nights, but Melora Walters is kind of one of the awesome. great underrated PTA weapons. Damn. Yeah. She's she she's so good, stars. and she's so yeah. good in this. Um, yeah. And she obviously that that final shot is kind of the indelible image of the movie, and it's all her. Me. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. I miss her. I miss, I miss, her I miss everybody. <laughs> Getting old. Don't, get old. Don't get old. Listen. Brian, you're it's not that old. Me. You're making us all look bad. Um, Jay? Yes, sir. Before we get out of here, we're going to test your award season knowledge based on the film we just reviewed, which was Magnolia. Yeah. In a segment, Brian, we like to call It's an Honor to Get Nominated. Now, this is where we try to see if my good friend here, Jay Ledbetter, uh, knows anything about the Academy Awards at all and seeing if jay was magnolia nominated for any academy awards okay the one i know is cruise yeah That's outside nice. of that this is a very weird movie yeah it is a weird and movie. i'm trying to think whether or not i'm gonna usually the weird movie gets in for screenplay i will say original screenplay okay i will say hopefully editing okay and i think oh man is there anything else outside of that any techs mm. the listeners are at the edge of their seats i know this is always great uh well, just it's it our is. greatest piece of content it's our greatest do. piece of content that i'm gonna do. say uh, that's it i'm gonna say those three well it was nominated for three it was nominated for cruise and original screenplay you were correct on that the editing you are wrong on sir well that's just it was nominated for best original song for save me oh yes yeah, that's a category i always forget about now jay that song was I... written for jerry Maguire. that song was written for jerry Maguire. Mm -hmm. really no i'm sorry wise up was oh okay i was like not hey. save me wise up was written for jerry Maguire. they didn't use it and they used it for magnolia what song jay save, save me is about dave foley of news radio and kid in the hall of fame according <laughs> to the i'm not lying you can go are you serious you i'm dead serious do you emmy man has these really fascinating connections <laughs> to the comedy world brian do you know what like she's uh, on comedy bang bang and stuff do you know what song save me lost to uh some disney song tarzan that year no that's correct was oh. it tarzan that was the Phil oh. Collins. That was yeah. also Blame Canada. That's uh, horrible. Music of the Heart, Music of the Heart, Diane Warren, and then uh, She Loved Me, but Randy Newman, Toy Story, th uh, story Toy Story oh, 2. Yeah. That should have won. That song makes me cry every damn time. Well, that whole <laughs> sequence does. Like before, yeah, there was, yeah. before there was Up, there was Toy Story 2 in that sequence. Right? Yes. There yeah. was the She Loved Me sequence. How do you yes. not nominate this thing for editing? I don't fucking people know. People think long movies shouldn't get nominated for editing because they're dumb. Well, because there's they always do the joke. How can a three hour and six movie be have best? Editing? Maybe they should have edited it more. I mean, there you go. We were going to hear that a lot I, this year. I think <laughs> <laughs> uh, the nominees for editing were The Sixth Sense, The Insider. Okay, we're off to a good start. American Beauty, The Cider House okay. Rules, which is Jay's favorite movie okay. of all time. Mm -hmm. and the winner was the matrix i mean that's a that's you a can't good deny one. that one i can't well deny edited that movie 
Yeah. This was just such a freaking good year. It was. I think we, we've talked about it a lot, but um, in years past, I believe. Have we talked about this one? Or maybe we just talked about when we talked about Cruise. What, 1999? Yeah, did we talk about 99 already? No, I don't think so. Did Haynes have a movie in 1999? No. Did he? I can't remember. It's been a while. I've confirmed the weird trivia I remember that Dave Foley claims that the song Saving was written about him. Well, there, there you go. I was worried right. we weren't going to get that in <laughs> under the gun. <laughs> well, I wanted to make sure I wasn't losing my mind. <laughs> it's the kind of thing where you're like, wait, did I dream that? No. This is a great no, I year. I mean, dream that. Brian, 99 favorite movies from that yeah. year. I mean, obviously, Magnolia is up there, but like, do you have other films that you love from that year? I think Eyes Wide Shut is a flat that's, out masterpiece. That's my one. Yeah, yeah. that movie's ridiculously yeah. good. I watch The Iron Giant on a regular basis oh. in terms of just like great 99 movies. Uh, Matrix, of course, is game changing. I was actually talking about that with my kids the other day, like what it was like, how much of the DNA of that movie you can see still today. Yeah. And how when it came out, it was like, and how you, we knew it instantly. Like it was one of those movies where you saw it and you're like, oh, well, shit's different now. <laughs> it's yeah, like, like, hey, everything's a little different. I walked change. into that theater, it was a changed person. Yeah. It reminds yeah. me of that, any like certain movies in my childhood, it reminds me of that scene in Mad Men where Ham has his son and they go see Planet of the Apes and they yeah. feel like they're the, like the DNA of them is forever changed. And so yes. they end up buying a ticket and they go see it again. Like yeah. that's the Matrix. Matrix did that. Yeah, that's Matrix. Matrix. really did that. Um, what else is 99? And there are so many good uh, movies. The, insi- I mean, the Insider, I adore. Being John Malkovich. Amazing. Three Kings is that year, I think, which is an underrated yeah. great movie. The Straight uh, Story, I love that movie. Six Sense holds up. I watched that with the kids the other day. I gave, We watched that on Halloween, believe it or not. Talented um, Mr. Ripley. Ripley. I love I Mr. Ripley rules. Mr. Ripley rules. rules. God, that's such a good movie. Inspector Another Gadget. Inspector Gadget. Another, Shut the fuck Inspector up. Gadget. Yeah. Uh, I forgot about it. The election, Boondock Saints. Election election rules yeah yeah it's a very good year yeah all about my mother oh pedro Pedro. yeah pedro oh my god that that's one of my that might be my favorite pedro the limey the limey's good rules yeah Yeah. phantom menace rat catcher we did talk about 99 ryan rat catcher lynn ramsey oh that's right we did talk about it's a good movie fight club yeah just Uh, mixed on fight club yeah, find my list. Um, Stuart Little, The Mummy, Brendan Fraser. If you like that sort of thing, if you do, <laughs> no, no, I, I can't do. find this. Um, Stuart Little, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> the most hated uh, Muppets from Space or Muppets movie, Muppets from Space, Muppets from Space. Underrated yeah. Altman movie, Cookie's Fortune. I like that movie. Oh, Cookie's Fortune is good. Oh, here we go. I found it. Um, I think we've mentioned them all. Toy Story Two is great. Topsy yeah. Turvy is great. Oh, Topsy Turvy is uh, great. John Malkovich, South Park. South Park's great. Uh, Mononoke. Oh, oh Mononoke is that year. That's right. That's because they didn't Witch have projects. There was project is that. Year. That's another big one in the of the moment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a really good one. Yeah, it's a damn good year. And they this make one, it- looking, looking at a list I made a long time ago and haven't looked at Magnolia's six. So that's pretty. They high. should make years like uh, like ninety nine more. Yeah, they should. Let's get on high. This one's. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this one's this year that we're in is pretty good. Bicentennial Man. It's good. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it's great. So yeah, although I still haven't seen a bunch. You haven't seen a bunch. What haven't you seen? It's Chicago Man. They haven't screened Ferrari here yet at all. Oh, I haven't seen. No, I, haven't, I haven't seen Ferrari either. Yeah, you're just naming names of movies, James. Deuce Stop Bigelow, it. Male Gigolo. God damn it. See, he does this. This is his bit. The He's Durkin just gonna movie. Name... Have you seen the Durkin movie yet? Yeah, I saw Iron Claw. Claw. It's good. Yeah. It's not great. Good. It's good. I like me Durkin though. So I'm gonna I love oh, Durkin. Man. I love Durkin. Man. Those are the two I'm most excited for. I mean, Wonka maybe. Um, Ooh. Why mm-hmm. does he love that candy? We got to know. Yeah. Ryan, are you telling us that you have a sweet tooth? I'm telling you that I like the Paddington movies. Like I think good. that's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that like that's what I said. We did a we did an episode recently, uh, like a movie star draft on the main show, and of the future, and we were like buying, okay. selling, or holding. Like who and, are the best movie stars under forty? It's yeah. So hard. what's best, making money or acting? We kind of we kind of went like like a both. little bit of both. 
Yeah, it's kind of important. Like, choices. Who's our next Nicholson? Huge success and also a great actor who makes good choices. Yeah, you got to make like, good that's choices. Kind of the, the best. But like, part. it was interesting. Leo is first? sort of the benchmark. Leo's not under forty. No, no, no. no, no I know. We, I'm saying like who's we had the like next we had Leo. like a list of oh. like fifty people, and we went though, and there were like ten that we that we ended up picking. Okay. But so uh, who was the number one pick under forty? We didn't like settle on. I mean, like, my one number person. one was uh, made like. Austin Butler is the guy I'm buying buying in on. I think the guy I'm buying in on is uh, Paul Mescal. I think that that's the guy I'm going to stitch. That's my a good horse, one. My horse, too. Glenn Powell will make the list. I think he's interesting and could find Did we it. hold we on Powell? Bought, we definitely we bought buy? Glenn Powell. I think that I was smart. I saw those men health uh, ads, and I went, yeah, we should have bought. I mean, I totally bought. Um, yeah. There were some that we we that. that we just held, but anyway, no, it was that interesting when we talked one. about we talked about Wonka with Chalmay, who I think we held, but then uh, Holland's got that Fred Astaire movie too, and so and that's Paul King as well. So really, yeah. So it's really just testing yeah. you whether how much you love Paul King or not in that moment. That, that's that will be that's an interesting, interesting. one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that might know. test the I love Paddington movies. Uh, I will logic. reserve judgment on that <laughs> for now. Um, um, well, well, Brian, we uh, we will say we we sold Tom Holland. I yeah, we did that. Yeah, yes. Yeah, seems we like sold, we said he seems like a very nice guy. Uh, seems not, like a nice. Sure. No, I think that what I said was he's a nice guy that will hold Zendaya's handbag on a red carpet, and I think that that's. that's that's intense. that's a good existence. <laughs> that's a that good sounds existence like a great to have. Life. Are you kidding me? Oh my God! Um, th- where do we, we land on Pattinson? He's not forty yet. I this was the big debate, and I this and was I one lost. of the biggest debates where I, I, I said, pissed. as far as movies, it, it was kind of that line of if you ask me who one of my favorite actors of the next twenty years will be, I think Pattinson is probably too. one of those. But is he yeah. going to be like a movie star? Movie star? I don't really think so. He's too oh, no. weird. No, but I thought we were talking about like I think he could give some of the most interesting performances. Oh yeah, yeah, for yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. I yeah. was saying like he's going to do all those interesting performances and be Batman at the same time. That's what a movie yeah. star does. Like you know, I, I think mean? that's true. I think that's very possible. It, I mean, I think he could one for them, one from two for me, kind of thing. Exactly. And, and then my counter argument to that was he's the one Batman who's in the suit for eighty five percent of the movie, and that movie still sure co- my kids made even like no, he's Batman. So and I, that yeah, movie I, I made agree with that a billion dollars because <laughs> it doesn't matter that my kids don't know that he's batman if he's taking the paychecks and going to make claire denis movies with those paychecks yeah so i think he'll make it's pretty sweet the cycle work i mean what yeah. do you want him to do he's Fucking... in the next adam mckay movie get excited fuck i gotta okay. go yeah, right. yeah, yeah, <laughs> brian well, what if a political consultant <laughs> was a murderer God, yeah that will be a very sound... subtle message. i'm sure it'll be a uh, very taut Todd Phillips Joker. Um, but politics is bad, guys. There you go. It's very bad. Very um, bad. <laughs> Brian, I'm gonna you, need Adam McKay to they, tell me that before I really make a decision. I know. Brian, true. thank you so much for coming on. Uh, can you tell everybody where they can find you and all your work on the internet? Primarily RogerEbert.com. Um, I promote some stuff at other places still on Twitter slash X slash whatever we're calling it while the ship is going down. Ryan underscore Tallarico over there. I'm also on blue sky, but that ship is not quite yet been put out to harbor the ocean yet, whatever analogy we're using metaphor. Uh, the point is just try to find me on social. I'll be somewhere. Um, Roger Ebert.com. I got a piece at arrow film soon on post departed Scorsese that I'm really happy with. So people should read that. Oh, nice. Kind of time, last six movies together under a banner of like an old man looking for meaning. And I think it's really a good piece. Um, And then I'm doing a piece on Fargo for the times, the show, New York times, and just a kind of a history of that show. And then I got mostly Ebert is where most of my stuff is. And the playlist. I do like three TV reviews a month for the playlist. There you go. Brian, you're the best, one of the best in the business, buddy. We love you so much. Thank you for coming on. Thanks guys. And uh, Jay, where can we find you and all your work? I'm leading with Letterbox now. Just find me on Letterbox, J Ledbetter. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, it's at Mr. J Ledbetter. Ryan, I said I'm going to do it every week now. I'm going to give week. you one movie rec. Yeah. This isn't a great movie, but it has an amazing lead performance The Burial on Amazon. Oh, which oh, yeah, Fox absolutely rocks the house in that movie. Yeah. 
Uh, Crazy so, underrated actor Jamie Foxx. I think Jamie Foxx rules. Yeah. So I'm excited to see that. Excellent. Yeah, he's he's so good, and they clone Tyrone. Just a ton of fun. Yes, in Jamie Fox in the PTA. That's a, that's a fun movie. Jamie yeah. Fox in a PTA movie win. Would I would good. love it. That would be. Good. I think it's famous. I was arguing about someone with someone about this the other day because they were. I was said he was underrated, and they're like he's super famous. I'm like, yeah, no one really takes him seriously. Like his range no. is insane. I think it's because he's, well, he's like so he's so comedian. Talent, like, and you see musician. him do the impression of Trump and stuff, and it's like, what? yeah can't this guy do he can yeah. sing that's, he can dance. that's what i'm saying i'm yeah. like yeah he's a household name but i think people underappreciate his range of ability i, I really like him and i do want a good call good reminder at the burial i have not seen yet i do want to see that yeah you get it is a great low. it's like a yeah. crowd pleasing and i i had a really good time with it it's not gonna make your best of the year list or anything i don't <laughs> think but honestly fox might make my like top 10 cool. lead performances of the year maybe yeah. I think he's he awesome. nice for me for Tyrone, believe it or not. Like, yeah. That movie's fun. Yeah. He's really I, gotta, that. I gotta watch both. I'm behind. Yeah. I'm not. This is the uh the time of the year where you get to catch up on little gyms that, that's, that, that yep. you didn't get to that's catch up. That's what I'm trying on. to do too. Catch up on Amazon movies days. that always get buried. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean yeah. the title I of that never, movie I is never caught up with air. I'm gonna do that. You haven't seen air? No, I never got around. Did you leave South by before air premiered? I did. It was it was like I left the day before. No. Brian and I were at South by for all you. Spoiler alert, there. Brian. They signed Michael Jordan. Oh, never God. heard of him. Damn right, it, Jay. Go. Fucking spoiling shit on as this a, podcast. As, as, as a Chicago guy, I'm not sure if he's really familiar. So. <laughs> never heard of him. All right. All right uh, you, can, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, I ran McQuaid 77. You can find all my work at awardswatch.com, other various places on the internet as well. Uh, if you like podcasts, you can go over and listen to the main show. That's uh, one that we release every Monday. Uh, if you like this podcast and that one, you can give us five stars on uh, iTunes or Spotify. Um, and just, uh, oh, while you're over on the website, sign up for the newsletter. You can get all of our great stuff. We've got a ton of interviews, ton of reviews, ton of podcasts, all the different stuff, news, everything you want. Get sent out to you two times a week. Eric really likes doing it. We'd really appreciate it if you signed up for it. And next week, we will be back. We will be talking about Punch Drunk Love, and we will have a great friend and a colleague of Brian's. We will be having the great Robert Daniels on to talk about that film with yeah, us. It's going to be Thank good. It's going to be good. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll see you all next time.